So we're going to cover chapter 14, Normal Human Microbiota, A Delicate Balance of Power. We want to compare the composition of microbiomes from different areas of the body. You should be able to list the benefits of the microbiota, explain the intercommunications between the human cells and microbiota, discuss how the human body prevents infection by our microbiota, Describe the hygiene hypothesis and the potential role of microbiota in preventing allergies and other modern diseases. So our scenario, a few months ago, Jason, a 38-year-old software salesman, reported to his physician with complaints of unsatisfactory stools. The frequency of his stool was about two to three times a day, but fluctuated from week to week from being semi-solid and covered with thick mucus to small, hard, elongated pellets. He also complained of having weekly episodes of severe cramping and pain all over his abdomen that would come and go during the course of the day. He said he belched frequently and would sometimes experience an ineffectual urge to pass stool, occasionally passing only gas. The diagnosis, Jason was ultimately diagnosed with a nebulous disease called irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. IBS affects 10 to 15% of the U.S. population. Although microbes are involved, IBS is not an infection. The cause of Jason's distress was most likely a shift in the microbial composition of intestinal contents. Change in the mix of bacteria and archaea residing in the intestine, for example, can lead to inflammation in the bowel and the symptoms Jason experienced. The outcome, the clinician recommended that Jason ingest yogurt and other foods containing microorganisms that normally inhabit the intestine, such as Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus species. The hope was that these bacteria could help restore the microbial composition of his intestine to a more healthy balance and thus reduce inflammation. In this case, the treatment worked. It doesn't always. And within a week, Jason's gastrointestinal symptoms disappeared, much to his relief. For this section, we want to be able to list the body compartments that are sterile and discuss why they're sterile. We should be able to list the body compartments that are populated by microbiota and name the key species found in each, and identify the key features of the populated body sites that influence microbiota composition. So this chart shows the common species of organisms that we see in many different areas of the body. As you can see highlighted, these are the main organisms that we would expect to see. For example, in the nose, commonly we see staphylococci. In the skin, the staphylococci of the coagulase negative kind, and staph aureus, and Propionobacterium acnes, and in the vagina, Lactobacillus species, a Gardnerella vaginalis, and Candida, in the small intestine, Lactobacillus, and Bacteroides, and Enterococcus, in the stomach, Helicobacter, in the ear, Staphylococcus coagulase negative type. The oropharynx, Staphylococcus coagulase negative type, Inveridens streptococci, as well as Neisseria. And in the large intestine, lots of different types, including Bacteroides, Infusobacterium, Escherichia coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Peptostreptococcus, and Enterococcus. If we look at where the prominent bacterial uh, populations are, you'll see that, uh, again, they're scattered throughout the body. On the skin, we can see about 10 to the 4 to the 6 per sweat gland colony forming units, or bioburden, in an aerobe to anaerobe ratio of 1 to 10. <clears throat> it's usually acquired over the lifetime, but initially at birth canal, and then the oral and external environments. For the mouth, we would see 10 to the 6 to the 8, aerobe to anaerobe 1 to 10, again initially at birth canal, and then from the caregiver and the food and water and fingers. And the genitourinary tract, 10 to the 8 to the 9th, and for the vagina and the urethra, 1 to 100 aerobe to anaerobe, surrounding external environments where you get these from, and the intestines. 10 to the 11th per cubic centimeter. Aerobed to anaerobe, 1 to 1,000. So you see the anaerobes definitely take over there. 
We get them initially as a fetus, then the baby formula and the mother ingestion of food and water. So let's look at each of these components. For the skin, the average human adult has over two square meters of skin or epidermis populated by 10 to the 12 microorganisms. And the areas may be dry or they're moist or they're salty or they're acidic. So this determines the types of organisms you may see from place to place when it comes to the skin. And again, the major types we see are staphylococci, coagulase negative, staph aureus, propionobacterium acnes, but you may also see Haemophilus and the viridin streptococci and mycobacterium and bacillus and candida. Again, most of these are just on the external areas. In the eye, the eyes produce antimicrobial factors like lysozyme. So maybe we don't see as many, but they're colonized by many types of bacteria. So staphylococci coagulase negative, Staph aureus, Haemophilus, and Streptococcus. Then for the oral and nasal cavities, we would expect to see quite a bit because these areas are exposed on a common basis to organisms. So the nasopharynx is the area from the nose to the oral cavity. And the oropharynx is the area between the soft palate and the upper edge of the epiglottis. So in the nose, we would commonly find a Staphylococcus coagulase negative type, Staph aureus, Haemophilus, the Viridin streptococcus, and streptococcus pneumoniae. So the oral and nasal cavities, usually we get the organisms here within hours of birth. Human infant's mouth is colonized with non-pathogenic Neisseria species, and Streptococci and Actomyces, like the bacillus and some of the yeasts. These organisms come from the surrounding environments, like the mother's skin and the garments. And when your teeth emerge, anaerobes like Trevitella and Fusobacterium colonize. And then Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus salivarius form a glycocalyx. This helps it firmly adhere to their oral surfaces and to each other. Dental procedures often allow bacteria to enter the blood vessels and be transported to other areas like the heart. If this happens, they can grow vegetations and cause symptoms of subacute bacterial endocarditis. So dental procedures really are extremely uh, have potential for danger. They're really not minor things. The respiratory tract again constantly in contact with the environment. Microorganisms that make it into the trachea are trapped by the mucus luckily produced by the ciliated lining of the airway and that mucus lining of the trachea bronchi and the bronchioles make up the mucociliary escalator and this is constantly sweeping the mucus with the foreign materials upward and out. Either you swallow them in the lungs or you end up coughing or sneezing. But we do commonly have all kinds of infections that may occur because of the respiratory system. Often get colds and flu, etc. Of the stomach, the stomach contents are quite acidic, and that's usually pretty lethal to bacteria. The mucus line in the stomach is less acidic, though, and so can support growth of certain organisms like Helicobacter pylori. They can incite inflammation in the stomach and cause gastritis or gastric ulcers. For the longest time, we thought oral ulcers were caused by other things, and now we know it is an infection quite often, and we can take antibiotics for it. Okay, case history. Renita, a 67 year old woman, complained to her physician of having persistent diarrhea with weight loss, bloating, excess flatulence. Renita also said her stools looked greasy, which the physician knew as a sign that ingested fat was not being absorbed. 
A blood test was revealed that the woman's vitamin B12 level was abnormally low. Cultures of fecal specimens failed to find any typical bacterial pathogens that could cause diarrhea. The decreased vitamin B12 level and excess fat in the stool suggested that the woman had malabsorption disease. The physician, initially perplexed, suddenly realized that the cause could be small intestine bacterial overgrowth disease. Diagnosis confirmed by aspirating fluid from the jejunum of the small intestine. The laboratory discovered abnormally high numbers of facultative and anaerobic bacteria in the fluid, including Streptococcus, E. coli, Lactobacillus, and Bacteroides. Fermentation by these organisms produced the bloating and flatulence. Antibiotic uh, treatment corrected the syndrome. So the human intestine. Normal human intestine has 10 to the 9th to 10 to the left bacteria per gram of feces. And is populated by, by both anaerobes and facultative anaerobes. So mostly in 1,000 to 1 ratio. Again, mostly anaerobic. Uh, the jejunum, <clears throat> uh, which is one of the beginning parts of the smaller intestine here. <clears throat> Slightly alkaline from secretions of the pancreas and gallbladder because of the bile. And then the ileum and cecum, which are lower down, are slightly acidic and have less bile. The colon, which is the large intestine, is slightly acidic. Now, the normal microbiota does have many functions for us. It ferments the unused energy substrates, trains the immune system, prevents growth of pathogenic bacteria, regulates the development of the gut, produces vitamins for the host, produces hormones to direct the host to store fats. <clears throat> and the type of organisms we'll quite often see in the small intestine are lactobacillus, bacteroides, and enterococcus. But again, we may see viridin, streptococci, clostridium, enterobacteriaceae, and the mycobacterium. In the large intestine, along with Bacteroides, Fusobacterium, E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Peptostreptococcus, and Enterococcus, we may see Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, Actinomyces, Acinetobacter, and Mycobacterium. If we compare the different types of bacteria by the different obesity levels of people. And in this particular case, we also compared someone that's had a gastric bypass. <clears throat> you see that obese patients often will have a fair number of archaea and methanobacteriales types of bacteria, where the normal weight patient is mostly the normal types of bacteria. The gastric bypass person may have more normal bacteria, but could potentially have some of the others. Now, what we will often see in the intestines is hydrogen buildup from bacterial fermentation that normally uh, feedback inhibits fermentation. So that's why we normally wouldn't see something like a methanogen. So then H2 oxidation by the methanogens occurs, and if that's present, it counteracts H2 buildup that allows fermentation to continue. And then the fermentation end products, such as acetate and butyrate, can be utilized by the human cells that result in weight gain. So an area that we have looked at with people, uh, their gut health, and people with problems with obesity has been probiotics. So probiotics, we, they contain bacteria to populate, repopulate GI tract with helpful microbiota. Most commonly used probiotics contain species of Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium. Fecal transplants will replace harmful bacteria with helpful bacteria as a treatment for inflammatory intestinal disease. 
So we're seeing fecal transplants being